and welcome to the BC Alumni Podcast. I'm Bethan from BC's alumni team and in each episode we welcome a different member of our alumni community back onto campus to chat all about what they've been up to since they graduated from BCU. Today we're joined by Patrick Le Kermont. Hello. Born in France, Patrick came to school in the UK when he was just 11 years old. He soon decided that he wanted to become a designer and he arrived in Birmingham in 1962 to study industrial design at the Birmingham College of Arts and Crafts, one of the colleges which ultimately became BCU. After graduating in 1966, Patrick was keen to become a designer for a top automotive company as he had already grown incredibly passionate about cars. He secured himself a role at Simca, which was later brought by US-based Chrysler as an automobile designer. Patrick soon moved to Ford, where he worked for 17 years for both Ford of Britain and Ford Germany, working his way up the ladder to become head of design in Germany. At Ford, Patrick was, was responsible for the designs of the likes of the Ford Cargo and the Ford Sierra, which is a vehicle that had a significant influence on the automobile industry. The alumnus joined the Volkswagen Audi Group in 1985 for two years before he was given the opportunity to take charge of design at Renault. He arrived as the Vice President of Design but eventually worked his way up to become the Senior Vice President. Patrick's first major project at Renault was the Twingo. This year marks 30 years since the Renault Twingo was launched in continental European markets and it is now in its third generation. It is a four-seater city car that was designed under the direction of Patrick, who took an unusual approach and added a front-end layout to the car that resembled a smile. As well as the Twingo, Patrick spearheaded Renault's campaign to build the image of innovation and quality that it still enjoys today, leading on the designs of the likes of the Scenic, eSpace, Spider, Kangoo, Laguna, Aventine, Megane, and even Zero Emission Vehicles, Twizy and Zoe, as well as the low-cost Dacia range. From his time at Ford to Renault and everything in between, Patrick has now been responsible for an incredible 60 million cars in his career and he has won several major industry awards. Since leaving Renault in 2009, Patrick has also designed over 30 luxury yachts, as well as co-founding Bezign, the sustainable design school in France. In this episode, we will be exploring more about Patrick's career, how he has made his mark in his chosen industries and how he has become one of the leading designers in history. Patrick, thanks so much for coming into the studio today. Thank you. Thank you for having me. So what's it like to be back at BCU and when was the last time you were in Birmingham? Gracious me. Well, it feels <laughs> terrific. A bit of a journey in nostalgia, of course. And um, with regards to um, my last trip to Birmingham, that's in fact 26 years ago, where I, I came on a flying visit to, to be awarded a, a doctor honoris causa. So uh, I haven't come back since. So it's just wonderful to, to be back. So you studied here in Birmingham in the 1960s then. So what was it like to be a student in Birmingham at that time? Well, I think I, I was extremely fortunate to, uh, to have come to Birmingham and to have been in England at that time as well because uh, design education in France was no way near as good as, um, as the one in Britain. F when it came to fine arts or perhaps textile and so on, for sure, or fashion, let's say, but uh, product design, industrial design, no. This was the place to, to, to come. And so, <clears throat> yeah, I feel uh, uh, that I made the right choice. So over 60 million cars. That's obviously nothing short of remarkable. What was it about cars that made you want to work in the auto industry in the first place? Well, I I, I was a kid uh, as a kid. You know, I was uh, I loved cars, and um, uh, when when we drove with my my uh, family, my father had a very large car, and we sat in the car. There weren't that many cars on the road. And each of the members of the family was given a brand. And I, being the youngest, I was privileged and I was given <laughs> the name, I was given Renault. So I, I would win on every journey. And I became uh, absolutely uh, fell in love with, with Renault and fell in love with cars, uh, basically. And, and, uh, and remained so for uh, many years, uh, even though perhaps not, not so today. 
But yes, it's been a long, a long love, uh, love affair with motor cars. I suppose because motor cars in those days uh, represented a symbol of freedom, the notion mm -hmm. of uh, going from uh, point to point, going from a specific place to another. Um, and that's, it was also a, an industrial product where the designer could play a major role in, uh, in shaping it mm -hmm. and to give it a certain, uh, uh, certain character. So after completing your studies then, you worked for Simca before getting a job at Ford. So what was it like working for Ford? Um, you were obviously there for 17 years, so you must have made a significant contribution. I worked, uh, indeed, a long time, 17 years. Uh, began in Great Britain, then moved uh, a few years later to Germany, back to Britain, back to Germany. Then I, I um, made a last uh, period in the United States. Um, the... I just went up the ladder, basically. It was a highly competitive uh, environment. And uh, interestingly enough, I met one of my former uh, student uh, friend uh, yeah. in Ford uh, named uh, Trevor Creed, who later became um, a vice president of Chrysler Design and retired. Um, it was, as I said, uh, highly competitive. And when I joined uh, Ford, um, I was looked upon as being uh, a, a kind of an advanced designer. I did, never seemed to actually win a anything, really. Mm -hmm. um, but and people thought, well, this guy is a bit way off. I mean, he's, he's doing stuff which may be in 10 years' time or 15 years. Mm -hmm. But I was very lucky that I... I had for a chief uh, a designer, a German called Uwe Bansen, a bit of a legend, who loved to talk, and we, we talked uh, to each other. And that at one spot, I mean, I think a couple of years, or maybe even less than that, he offered me to continue my study. Uh, and so I, I worked and also studied mm -hmm. at what is today called Anglia Ruskin, and I did an MBA. And um, it was all very much falling in line with my wish that design should be recognized and not be just, you know, little artists, uh, but that yeah. we, we should be looked upon as, uh, as managers, people who thought and not just uh, uh, came up with nice pictures or to illustrate yeah. the marketing um, positioning. Um, so these the, had very, very formative years in, in Britain. I went on to uh, to, to Germany with, with a, pr a promotion and I stayed there uh, a few years, worked on quite a few cars like uh, the Granada and the uh, and Taunus and so on. Um, and I was uh, appointed for a, a very a much senior job in Britain where I became an executive designer in charge of um, advance and trucks. And this is where I had this wonderful experience of working on a truck uh, called the Ford Cargo. And I think the Ford Cargo is, is a, there's a parallel between the Ford Cargo and later at Renault with a Twingo. In both cases, I had, it had to do with a, a boss who was brand new to, uh, to, to the world of product development, mm -hmm. knew, had no experience with design. And when we presented this very, very, very modern design, he, he just thought it was quite normal and he felt a bit you know, as if he, he was a bit surprised and startled to a certain extent. But basically our design intent was respected and we came up with a truck which um, not only was truck of the year, but also was uh, manufactured for 40 years, you know. Um, and I have really, this is in my mind, one of the two vehicles that I would put in my list of the vehicles that I'm proud of. Yeah. So. Then I moved on to Germany, remaining an executive designer, sort of number two in Ford of Germany, involved then very closely to the to the Sierra, which was, which was really a, a, a program which um, a bit of a revolution in the, in the automobile world, um, and um, the, the 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 vehicle I had a bit of a tough time when it arrived in Britain because British buyers. Um, were maybe a little more conservative uh, since the car it was replacing was the Cortina, which was a, 
uh, a very very conservative, mm-hmm. nicely designed uh, vehicle, and that the Sierra just didn't correspond exactly to to what they, uh, they, they, they they liked. I mean, they got used to it, and, and it turns out the Sierra was a, was a highly successful vehicle. Um, anyway, I, I got a promotion. I was then put in charge of the design center in, uh, in Germany and earmarked to become the next uh, vice president. And I was sent to the US. Uh, didn't like what I saw and um, and decided to um, yeah to 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 actually hand in my resignation, uh, and then I moved out. But in any case, I learned an enormous amount in Ford, mm. so I have lots of very fond memories at that time. So soon came the opportunity of a lifetime at Renault. Then, can you talk me through how that came about and why you were the perfect fit for them? First of all, because I loved Renaults, um, and I have to say I applied eleven times. Uh, sometimes not receiving an answer and so on and so forth. And it so happened that um, within Renault, the design organization was called Styling at the time, and the head of the styling organization uh, had a a health problem, and um, he asked for an early retirement. And so they wanted to appoint an engineer. Um, The fellow uh, appeared to be a good candidate because uh, he dressed uh, funnily and um, and uh, he could draw a caricature and I think his father was a gar- gallery owner so all of that is of course just absolutely perfect mm-hmm. to replace the designer but uh, the the directors of the styling department refused they said no we can't accept that we accept that none of us are good enough to become the next head but no we will not accept that an engineer becomes our head why don't you go and get a real professional like Patrick Le Quibon? And this is how, um, you know, I, I was um, uh, I was contacted. I had an interview with the president of the um, of the company in his home uh, because of you know the, the fact of being recognised and so on. Yeah. And I, I I rang the bell and I went upstairs and I arrived in this very bourgeois like interior and this. Um, uh, this man uh, asked me to come and sit, and uh, he said, "Oh, um, I know nothing about design." He said, "Well, no, I'm, yes, I do know something about design. I went to a, a fair in Paris last year, and I bought I bought a toilet brush, and they told me it was very designed." And there was a smile on his face. You know, the guy had a fantastic sense of, of humor. But anyway, I left his office, thinking, you know, one must remember that Renault was in close to bankruptcy, okay? And I didn't actually negotiate my sh- my salary. That, that, I was, that was not my thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, but basically I left and he asked me, uh, he, uh, he wanted to hire me and he wanted, to, he gave me carte blanche, a total free hand, to do what I, would, I wanted to do uh, with the design department, but make sure that I get back innovation into Renault, which had been producing very highly conservative um, uh, vehicles mm-hmm. and I said the one of the first thing that I would like and that's the only condition that I will basically impose is I do not want this new organization which I intend to call design uh, to answer to engineering it has to answer to the product development group at the same level as engineering or or product planning and he said fine we've got a deal and so that's how I, I, I joined uh, Renault under excellent conditions with a cut in my salary of 40%, which they made up within two years. So, yeah, that was just perfect. So your first major project at Renault was, of course, the Twingo, now celebrating its 30th birthday. Mm. You still rolled into many issues whilst designing the Twingo. So can you tell me about them and how it could have been a totally different car? Yes, in fact, um, before leaving, the former head of the styling activity gave me two keys, and he said, "Okay, this is the, these are um, keys of uh, models which are uh, shut up in garages somewhere in in western of Paris in the suburbs, and it, it's a program that you might really be interesting to to to, to look at." Mm-hmm. And so, as soon as he left, uh, you know, I had been in the 
in the company maybe less than than a month i um, had these two models brought back uh, to to the design center and uh, they opened the boxes and i saw these two models one didn't interest me uh, too much but there was this funny little car which i thought was very interesting because it was a one box design by one box it means one silhouette not you know a broken windshield mm -hmm. and then the hood uh it was smallish probably too small to almost close to one of these city cars or these uh, funny cars that they have in france which uh, people at 16 can drive all you know young people yeah. at 16 but they don't have a, a license and they're bloody dangerous too but um uh and it had a, um not a very nice front end it really um really a, a sad uh, sad but but also uh, uh, grumpy yeah a grumpy look and uh I, I organized a meeting with the president and uh, I had no I had I knew that this car had been got rid of or stopped because it wasn't making any money um, and and I said yes but you know you've given me uh, this assignment of uh, uh, innovation and this car really has enormous potential for me it represents the um, uh, the DNA of the, uh, of the company and he agreed to give me a small group of engineers and we reworked the package made it just just a little bit bigger so that it could become of a size that people would use it even to go on motorways and go mm -hmm. away on a vacation and i set the team to you know to improve the car and of course to try to find a front end because the front end was just really the poorest part of the car mm -hmm. and as time went by there was no answer. I, I just couldn't get something that I was happy with. And what I wanted to do was to get a car which was happy. You know, I, I, I called it, well, after after the drawing that I'm going to talk about, La Voiture du Bonheur, the, the car of happiness. And um, time was going by, you know, and we were coming close to this uh, presentation. And then finally, I did something which I did never did. Namely, I did myself a sketch, you know, to just to convey the idea, gave it to the director of exterior design uh, after the car. And it was a very simple sketch of a uh, front end of, of a car um, with and the car had a smile and inside was a, a fellow driving it also with a huge smile. And I said, this is what we've got to do. It's got to have eyes and you've got to uh, you've got to be able to recognize it's got to be almost to have yeah. a human uh, feeling, you know. And um, and we 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 immediately worked on that, you know, very quickly. And um, then came the, the the day of the of the presentation. And I recall there was first of all the economic you know, me the meeting on the economics of the car. And uh, basically, they had made huge improvements, but the car was still not satisfactory for a company that was in dire straits, you know. So um, they said, well. Maybe we just go and have a look at the at the car. So we went down the stairs to the showroom. It was covered, had the car uncovered, and the car uh, smiled at the president, and the president smiled at the car. And you know, you must remember, I was just brand new in the in the company, as yeah. you know. Uh, and in that company, you know, people, you know, some of them had been there thirty years or whatever. Um, and I said to the president, "This is not, this is not a car. You know, it's like a pet." And in fact, um, when you go, when you drive it home, if it's very cold outside, you don't leave it outside. You don't park it outside. You put it under your arm and you take it upstairs and put it in front of the chimney. And the president understood my humor and so on and so forth because you know I I, I had got to know him re reasonably well. Yeah. But the rest of the of the directors, you know, they thought this guy is mad. <laughs> And we soon are going to see blood all over the place. <laughs> but that didn't happen. So uh, the president said, well, you've really got to make efforts on this, 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 and that from a financial st standpoint. And then we'll do the market research. OK. So here it goes. Uh, all the work is done. And then the time comes to, to do the market research. Market research, uh, just like in Ford, was 
David Ogilvy had a very good expression. He said that market re or companies use market research like a drunkard uses a lamppost, more for support rather than illumination. Anyway, the results were presented. The president wasn't there, uh, but it was just all the senior members outside of the president and maybe the executive committee. And the result was that 25% um, people just loved the car. You know, the people had seen the models and they saw our model and they just loved it. But they, they, it wasn't just appreciate, they didn't just appreciate, they loved the car. 25% mm -hmm. said, yes, we like it, but we wouldn't like to be the first on the block to drive. Yeah. And 50% hated the car. I mean, actually loathed the car and said, this is not a car, it's not serious, it's, you know, it's a caricature, uh, it's been designed by Walt Disney and so on and so forth. And uh, an enormous amount of pressure uh, put on me to change the car, to change the front end, to wipe off the smile mm -hmm. and then just give it a serious look, you know. And um, there was no one who actually defended that. You know, everybody agreed that I had to change the car. I went on a long, it was a long weekend, uh, and, and um, I, I went to, to the south of France and I was thinking about this. This was before, uh, you know, emails existed. And when I came back, I sent a small note to the president and I wrote, uh, and, and this was uh, already uh, uh, taking a risk because he was not my boss, I had somebody in between. But anyway, I sent him a note and saying, um, the biggest risk of the company is not to take any risk. And I ask you to uh, choose between uh, instinctive design and extinctive marketing. And he wrote back on the note, I completely agree with you, mon cher director, my dear director, let's go. And that's how the car was approved. But um, of course today, you know, when, you, when history is told, including in books, and then they never tell that part, mm. or they try not to, except that the president, Raymond Lévy, uh, in the press, preface of the book, he told the story. Uh, and so now, uh, you know, if you go on the in internet and you put uh, uh, instinctive design versus X, then you'll find the story. <laughs> so that's the story of the Twingo. So what do you make of the auto industry now then? And do you think more creativity is needed in the cars of today? I don't feel at ease with the automobile industry today. Um, I, I think, first of all, I, I, I did have a... Um, just before the year 2000, I, I really had serious uh, doubts um, about what I had done. You know, uh, you made reference to 60 million cars, but you know, just to make it graphically uh, more visible, mm -hmm. were you to put these 60 million bumper to bumper, no space, just bumper to bumper they would go down 6,438 times around the world. Okay, that's a, one hell of a, of a traffic jam. And of course, I became more and more conscious of uh, the planet and, yeah. uh, and all that is uh, related to uh, uh, just saving ourselves, you know, from, from the woes that, is, that we are facing. Mm -hmm. um, I feel the automobile industry Today, I understand they're moving towards, uh, uh, you know, electric vehicles. Mm -hmm. Fair enough. Except that the making of electricity is, uh, is made, you know, the electricity made comes from charcoal burning uh, uh, central, uh, whatever they're called. Um, and I find also that there is a lack of imagination and we're... Uh, surrounded uh, with um, SUVs, which I refer to such uninteresting vehicles, and they all look very much alike. Mm. And, and I, I don't see uh, m much of identity and I don't see much change happening. And I fear that in the automobile industry, the design world is not present enough that we've reverted back to just styling, basically. Um, but I don't see a sort of a politically committed, or politically not in the sense of a, you know, of a party, but mm -hmm. engaged or 
uh, world on the side of, of design. You know, it's as if uh, we're just accepting, designers are accepting the message given to them and just, uh, you know, no, I don't want any uh, arguments, just do it, you know. Mm. And they come up basically with very similar stuff the world over. So in recent years, then, you've been designing yachts. So can you tell me more about how that opportunity came about and what you've achieved in this new step in your career? Well, I learned uh, to get back into drawing just before uh, I, I left Renault uh, because I participated in, a, in an article which uh, asked for us to, uh, for designers, uh, senior designers to come up with a drawing um, and, uh, and that it should be an icon, something that we consider to be iconic. I chose uh, a Laiole knife, which is something very uh, traditional. Uh, even though it was re, uh, revisited by Philip Stark. And uh, I did a rather nice drawing. And I felt that, it, you know, getting back into drawing seriously, I mean, of course mm. I continue to draw, but seriously, um, was like, you know, getting back on a bike, basically. Uh, and I did this nice drawing, and it was just fluke, you know, because the next drawing I did was just awful. And the one after that was even worse. So. Basically, it just tells you that uh, you never, never get a free lunch. It, you really have to work very hard. I got back into drawing, and then I was contacted by a company, a big group, who contacted me um, for a quality-oriented uh, project. Because in Renault, I was also for four years the corporate uh, quality man. And uh, they asked me to, they made boats, and could I help them to improve the, the perceived quality of their group? So I got involved, established processes. They accepted all those. And then at one point, uh, one of the uh, bosses said, uh, how would you like to you know, design a, a, a boat for us? I said, a boat? But I, I've never designed boats. I mean, I know nothing about boats. He said, oh, don't worry, you, you'll be working with a, a really good team. Yeah, you know, give it a try. So I, I worked on this very first boat, which was the um, Outremer 5X, which is a catamaran, sailing boat, okay? I'm into sailing boats. Um, even though I'm not a sailor, you know, but okay. <laughs> and the first boat did very well. It was uh, voted, uh, uh, elected European uh, Boat of the Year and multi hull of the Year in the, in the United States. And then, you know, then there was another and then another, and now sort of I've got to as you said at the introduction, 33 you know, boats. And I've got, right now, this very day, this day, uh, two boats being launched at the uh, Cannes uh, Yachting Festival. So I, I got into the yacht by absolute pure accident. Mm. And uh, what I did know is that when I left Renault, I, I banned the word, I'll say it so, softly, retirement, okay? And I just didn't want to, I mean, I, I I just didn't want to just go cycling or learn something new or what I wanted to do is start as an apprentice into a t something I knew nothing about. I didn't want mm -hmm. to be a trophy designer. So I just wanted to start at something right at the bottom. Well, I, I didn't really, but but uh, I had to learn everything. And then, yeah. and so now I've been, you know, working about yeah, 12, 13 years in this uh, in this business and and uh, I, I just just love it you know i'm just so happy to to be so busy <laughs> really busy <laughs> so you've also co-founded your own design school so what inspired you to set it up and also what did the students at the school get out of it yes um i think it's very much based on what i was saying about uh, feeling starting to feel ill at ease about uh, that I had been a, a productive or participated as a productivist, you know, uh, producing, uh, mass producing uh, uh, vehicles w without having this uh, uh, concern about uh, natural resources, about, uh, about uh, the environment and so on and so mm -hmm. forth. And it so happened that I met up with a, a, a couple of people who, felt very much in the same way. One was uh, already the head of a very large uh, French uh, design school called Strat College. And the other was a very famous, very, very uh, world famous um, naval architect 
So the, the first one called Maurice Larivière and the second Mark Van Pittigam. And we had a, discussions for a couple of years and we elected to um, create a school, an international school uh, on the French Riviera because uh, it's much nicer than, you know, close to the Belgian frontier. Nothing against the Belgium, but, uh, you know, um, the weather is a little bit nicer. And and it's uh, it's unusual in the sense that uh, uh, it's in English, you know, the, the tuition is in English and it's totally international. So uh, we have you know, 29 nationality in the, in the school and um, we, we base our teaching on uh, the United Nations recognition of the, the, the points associated with uh, sustainability. Um, it's in, in the brief and we have uh, uh, lots of uh, students who will come to our school maybe to do the masters or maybe they will go to Laishan Shade and then move to another school. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's clearly very much uh, oriented towards uh, sustainability and we're uh, very involved with, uh, uh, with, uh, with industry, with institutions. We have uh, uh, continuously projects you know, with, co with companies, various companies or you know, hospitals or many, many different things. And um, yeah, it, it's it, it's something which we really felt we wanted to do and that we had to do. And I felt as a as an individual that it was a a, a bit of a small payback, you know. Um, so yeah, I'm very happy to have uh, participated in that. And it's it's um, it will celebrate its tenth uh, anniversary in, in October. So you've been selected as one of our industry icons at this mm. year's mm. alumni festival. So what does that mean to you? Well, it's a big word, you know. Um, well, well uh, I'm not sure I, how I can answer that. You know, of course, I'm very proud, you know, but uh, um, I think more so I, I'm, I'm, I, I'm, I'm proud that it actually comes from BCU, you know, because uh, basically I'm... I'm ever thankful for the education that I had here. I feel it's far better than what other people were getting in other universities at the mm -hmm. time. Um, taking not, not not taking anything away from, you know, the, the RCA where I was, um, I, I also taught at one time. But I think as, um, as a course in uh, what was in my days called product design engineering, mm -hmm. it was really one of the very, very best. And I can, I can say that I learned all the fundamentals uh, here. It was a damn good experience, uh, human-wise as well. Um, and so I can't think of a better place to receive such an honor as being called an icon of industry. But um, yeah, <laughs> I can't say any more than that. And final question then, if you could go back to your very first day here at BCE, <laughs> what is the one piece of advice that you would give yourself? I think it's opening out, keeping your eyes open. It's very much a message that um, I've tried to transmit to all the designers that I've worked with. I've hired hundreds of uh, designers in my time. And uh, to all the young designers that I'm, or students, um, I ask them to keep their eyes open. and. Um, the worst thing is to become a specialist in one field. And I think designers need to have a broad culture. Uh, they need to travel. They need to work with um, uh, people from various nationalities. And there is a, a saying from Enzo Ferrari, the, you know, the uh, founder of the Ferrari uh, motor cars, who said that um, um, teamwork has replaced the solitary genius and I think this, this is probably the key factor, this notion of working with people. And I'm delighted to, to uh, continue to work in that way with, even today, you know, I work with, with groups of people and with people coming from various countries. Um, so yes, that would be my advice. Thank you so much for popping by today, Patrick, and coming on to the podcast. Hopefully we'll see you again very soon. 
Thank you.